Good morning. I always look forward to my summer vacations. This year was supposed to be five weeks in Europe. Instead, I enjoyed a raft trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. 14 people and three guides on a raft for eight days covering 200 miles through calm water and rapids, hiking up to waterfalls, jumping off cliffs. You going again? I think I jump. Jumping off cliffs and then sleeping under the stars. During the calm water floating times, our guides would tell us about how the Grand Canyon was formed, going back almost 2,000 million years ago when water covered much of the region. Sand and mud and lava accumulated to a great thickness as volcanic islands collided with the southern edge of North America. Over the years, the deposits folded and buried and metamorphosed into crystalline rock, which were gradually gradually brought up to the surface. Eventually, within the last 75 million years, the uplift of the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Plateau placed all of these rocks into position, causing, about 6 million years ago, the river that once flowed north to change and flow south. Now, I need to tell you, most of this just went straight over my head. Believe me, it was far more detailed than what I just said. For me, it's actually very simple. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God, after creating light, said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And God saw that it was good. You see, over millions, possibly billions of years, the creator, artistic God, with great patience and attention to detail, allowed for a gradual buildup of rock layers by which he raised continents above the oceans. The canyon shows the suddenness and the power by which he acted at just the right moments to create a beauty that is both peaceful and, and awe-inspiring. Of course, part of the piece was probably because I was out of cell phone and internet reception. You know, scientists can point out rock layers and explain what happened, kind of. But the how and the power behind it, I mean, that's another story. As our guides talked, I thought, wow, what an awesome, artistic, powerful, creative God we have. Now, it, it just so happens that in the midst of all this, I found myself reading Chuck Swindoll's book on Job. Remember, Joe is the man who lost everything. I mean, he'd probably feel right at home in everything that we're facing today. In the middle of that book, Swindoll talks about our solar system. He begins the discussion by saying, everything within us longs to explain everything about God and interpret all of his ways and come to an understanding of all of the workings of God. But the deeper we dig, the more unfathomable he becomes. You see, we want to be able to explain and correctly analyze so that we can understand the whole story. But that's impossible when it comes to the living and reigning God. It's especially important that we realize that he's not like us. Neither are his methods like our methods. The prophet Isaiah says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we're finite, but God is infinite. Our ways are limited, but he's unlimited. We're small, but he is vast. And then Swindoll continues, imagine a perfectly smooth glassly pavement, pavement on which the, the finest speck of dust can be seen. Now shrink our sun from 865,000 miles in diameter to only two feet across and place a ball of that size on the pavement to represent the sun. Now step off 82 paces and to represent the first planet, Mercury, put down a tiny mustard seed. 
and then take 60 more steps and, and for Venus, put down a BB and then 78 more steps and, and put down a green pea representing the Earth. Now step out 108 more steps for Mars and, and put down a pinhead. Now take 788 steps further out and place an orange down for Jupiter and then 934 steps and a golf ball for Saturn. And now mark off 2,000 and 86 steps for Uranus and put down a marble. And then another 2,322 steps for Neptune and put down a cherry. We've gone two and a half miles out and we still haven't gotten to Pluto, which is another, another 200, I mean, another two and a half miles out. And guess how far we would have to go before we would put down another two foot size ball to represent the nearest star. 6,720 miles. And that's just the first star among 2 billion in our solar system. Among 2 billion or more galaxies. And all of this is in perpetual motion, perfectly synchronized, the most accurate timepiece known to man. A.W. Tozer writes this, Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him to where we can use him or at least know he's there when we need him. We want a God we can in some measure control. We need the feeling of security that comes from knowing what God is like. And what is he like? Well, of course, it's a composite of all of the religious pictures that we've ever seen. All the best people we've ever known or heard of all the sublime ideas that we've ever entertained. Now, if all this sounds strange, it's only because today we too often take God for granted. The God of contemporary Christianity, Tozer writes, is only slightly superior to the gods of Greece and Rome. That God can be known by the soul in tender personal experience while remaining infinitely aloof from the curious eyes of reason constitutes a paradox. And so this summer, I was struck anew by the majestic vastness of God and yet his desire to be personally known. I am struck by this eternal, timeless, creative God who continues to create and who calls us into a timeless eternity of creation and fellowship with him. But as Tozer says, we all too often want to shrink God down. Which brings us to our sermon text this morning. We're this fall working our way through Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Having begun well, these folks were beginning to shrink Jesus down. I mean, it was only natural. Every place they turned, they were reminded of the emperor Caesar who ruled the known world. On every street corner, there was another temple or altar to a, a different God. And now there's this new philosophy that's beginning to invade the church that taught that Jesus was one, that, that Jesus might have been great, but that he was just one of many. That there was more that one needed to know if one wanted to experience the supernatural powers that be. And so after an introduction and prayer, Paul gets to the heart of the letter when he writes or inserts what many believe was an ancient poem or hymn. Using a popular literary technique of the time called a chasm, where each line builds on the line before it until the climax is reached. And then as we move away from the climax, each line kind of is a parallel to the line that came up above, with the result being that we can see at a glance Paul's main point. And so we begin reading in verse 15. The Son of, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now, I need to stop there. Firstborn does not mean first created. It means first of many. But the Greek word that is used for firstborn really carries the sense of source, the foundation from which all of life comes. 
You see, what Paul is saying, that where God is invisible and all too vast for us to grasp or understand, God desires us to know him. And so in Jesus, the fullness of God dwells. If we want to know God, if we want to get, we need to get to know Jesus. He's the exact representation of God. His character, his purposes, his personality. But there's more. By looking at Jesus, we not only discover who God is, but who we are. He is the blueprint for genuine humanness. And Genesis 1 says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. Our lives should look like Jesus. And so if we want to know how to live, how to react, if we want to know what is important, how to make decisions that will yield positive results, if you want the significance of your life to last into eternity, model your life after Jesus. I mean, that is who we are slowly being transformed to be like. Jesus, how's that going in your life? I mean, talk about something to aspire to. Now, Paul then continues when he says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Okay, we need to stop again. All things. Let me emphasize that. All things, all powers, all authorities. Everything was created through him and for him. I mean, I get the through him, but the for him? I mean, that brings me up a little short. You see, Jesus is key both to the source of meaningful life and our ultimate destiny. He alone gives genuine life. You see, the good life doesn't come from wealth or possessions or power or a happy family or a long life. It comes from Jesus. Most of us moderns want life to be about us. We want things to be for us. I was recently reading about King Arthur and, and the round table. He created the table round so that everyone would have a sense that they were among equals. We like that. We get that. But that's not how God created. Everything was created for Jesus. We are a gift to Jesus. Do you live your life each day as if it is a gift that you are giving to Jesus? Before we move on, it's important to underline that if he created all things, all powers, all authorities, he's over all things. Nothing, no situation, no virus, no fire, no weather pattern, no health report, no person, no earthly power, political or otherwise, no heavenly power is greater than Jesus. Sometimes, well, often, maybe these days, minute by minute, we need to remind ourselves of that truth. And then Paul continues he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay, for me, this is where it gets kind of good. He holds all things together. This is where the Colossians were beginning to get things wrong. They thought there were other powers that needed to be reckoned with. And Paul's saying, no. It is Jesus who is over all powers. And more than that, who holds all things together. Now, I need to let you know, I am not really good at science. But if you get things down to a fourth grade level, I kind of find it rather fascinating. For example, take this stool, okay? If, if I were to sit on it or, or even climb on it, you would expect it to, to hold me up. I mean, it seems solid enough. It, it's holding me up now. And yet, this stool is anything but solid. I mean, it's made up of atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons orbiting around the nucleus from a distance, held together by a combination of gravity and energy that never lets up. You see, there's this sustaining power that keeps all of life going, an invisible power, a power that we take for granted. But Paul is cautioning us and saying that power 
resides in and comes from Jesus. He is the creator, source, and sustainer of all life. And all of life is for him. And then Paul writes, and he is head of the body, the church. As one person said, that sounds like a come down. And we've been talking about the beauty and the vastness and the complexity of creation with all of its variety. And now all of a sudden Paul starts talking about the church. But like the Colossians, we probably need our imagination stretched a little. Paul goes on when he says, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. You see, what Paul is now talking about when he's talking about the church is the new creation that now has invaded the world. It's that creation that we get a picture of at the end of Scripture in Revelation 21 and 22. You see, Jesus created the old order, the created order we live in, but because of our desire to listen to ourselves rather than simply trusting in Jesus... Because we wanted to make decisions based on what looked good to us or, or made sense to us rather than listening to Jesus. Our world became filled with brokenness. Brokenness between us and God. But also a brokenness between us and each other. A brokenness within ourselves. And even a brokenness within the management of our environment. You see, sin has less to do with a particular action and more to do with an attitude that says, I know best. I want to do things my way. I want to be in control. And when we do that, brokenness abounds. With the resurrection, Jesus is beginning to bring about a new creation, a creation of healing, of wholeness, of shalom, of flourishing, it's a creation we are now called to begin to live in and to invite others into. It is his work. It is by his power. But as we've learned these last few weeks, that power is available to us. That power enables us to love the way Jesus loved. That power enables us to be transformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus partnering with him now and into eternity, continuing to do the work of creating beauty, but doing it in his way and in his timing. As I floated down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, maybe it was because I turned 65 this year, but the thought of spending an eternity partnering with God, filling his universe with beauty, began to take on new meaning especially given the fact that I have absolutely no skills in art whatsoever. You see, the church is not a building. It's not a local association of people. It is all those who receive new life in Jesus, all past, present, future, who seek to live partnering with Jesus in his work. All those who are assured resurrection into the main event, the eternity that God planned before the creation of the world. I mean, we can't even begin to comprehend this. I mean, it's a little bit like explaining to a five-year-old the joys of adulthood and marriage and parenting. But Paul is calling the Colossians, he's calling us not to lower our sights, not to lower our aspirations, not to get up, caught up in the momentary passing things of this world, but rather to make sure our longings and aspirations are rightly placed. For God, Paul says, was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. Once, you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind and your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. I love those words. Free from accusation, blameless, without blemish. Now the adversary wants to constantly tear us down through our own self-talk and through the opinions and words and views of others. 
But Jesus says, no, you're saints, you're holy, you're set apart, you are a precious gift to me. Jesus took care of everything at the cross. Our calling is to live in the freedom and new life that is ours in Christ and to partner with Jesus in extending that life of peace and love to others. And then Paul says this, if you continue in your faith. Now don't let the if get to you. The if is not talking about our salvation. It's about talking about not settling for second best. It's about making sure we continue to have the right picture of Jesus, of who he is and all that he's doing and all that he's called us into. J.I. Packer says that the smaller our view of Jesus, the more immature we are in him. But as we grow in our view, so also we grow in our maturity. So Paul concludes, if you continue to live in the faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul sees himself as a servant of Jesus. Is that how I see my life? Do I serve Jesus or am I asking him to serve me? To be a Christian is not just to believe in Jesus. It's now to understand that Jesus has a calling on my life. Belief and calling are inseparable. When we become Christians, we're called to leave our old life behind and enter into a new life of working for him as his servant. There's a story about Albert Einstein taking a train to a big city years ago. The conductor came to gather the tickets, and when he got to Einstein, um, he asked for the ticket, and Einstein started going through his pockets and, and just couldn't seem to find it, and the conductor at this point recognized the great thinker and said, don't worry, Mr. Dr. Einstein, I trust you, don't worry about your ticket, and the conductor continued his rounds. A few minutes later, as the conductor was walking back through, he noticed that Einstein was down on his hands and knees looking under the seats for his lost ticket. And again, the conductor leaned over and said, don't worry. You, you don't need your ticket. We, we trust you. At that point, Einstein looked up and said, young man, it isn't a matter of trust, but direction. I'm searching for my ticket because I don't know where I'm going. We all need direction. We easily get lost. The Church of Colossae needed direction. They were losing their picture of the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. Over and over again in, his, in history, in scripture, God is calling his people to renew their vision of him. And we see it in the great revivals. We, we see it in the exile. And recently I've been reading that Exodus God, in the Exodus, through his mighty work, showed himself by bringing the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt, leading them into the promised land, the land of milk and honey, where, where he would provide for them, and, and they would be a blessing to the world. But throughout that journey, all the slaves wanted to do was to go back to Egypt. All they did was cry out for what they once had. And when God showed them the riches of the land he was leading them into, they cried out, there are giants in the land. Let us go back to Egypt. Let us go back to slavery. You see, they were looking around. They weren't looking up. It was one thing to get the slaves out of Egypt. It was quite another to get Egypt out of the slaves. And so they wandered 40 years in the wilderness while God raised up and trained a new generation of people who would trust him even in the face of giants. Sometimes I feel like during this time of isolation, this pandemic, these times of division and unrest and fires, God is wanting to work in each one of us to get the things of the world, of our culture out of us. And all we do is cry, let us go back to normal. Let us go back to being in control, to being independent, to being self-sufficient, to doing what we think looks best. And God is saying it's all a lie. You never really were in control. All you have is a gift from me to be used to bless others. Rather than being self-sufficient, learn to live dependent on me. I am enough. I am everything. I am sufficient. I am above all. If you want to know how to live life, if you want direction, if you want life, don't look around you. Look to me. 
Chuck Swindoll in that book on Job closes one of his chapters this way. He says this, let me ask you a question. Are you seeking to know the depths of God or are you just skimming the surface? Only you know the answer. Our current culture is so busy we can become proficient at faking it. We can look like we're going to the depths when in fact we're just skating. So you must answer for yourself. Are you seeking to know the depths of God? Or do you feel that you're just attending a lot of religious meetings, reading a few religious books, and learning all the religious sounding language? Larry Crabb writes, as a culture, present day Christianity has redefined spiritual maturity. The reformers knew that we were saved to glorify God. We moderns live to be blessed. The mature among us are now thought to be the successful, the happy, the effective people on the top of things and doing well. We're more attracted to sermons and books and conferences that reveal the secrets to fulfillment than to spiritual direction that leads us through affliction into the presence of the Father. We seem more interested in managing life into a comfortable existence than in letting God spiritually transform us through life's hardships. Swindoll says, that cuts to the quick, doesn't it? Don't run from hardships. Don't seek a friend who will help you get out from under it. Stay there. Stay in it. The Lord will get you through it. As a result, you'll stop skating. The question is for you to answer. Are you seeking to know the depths of God, or are you skimming the surface? Would you join me in prayer? Lord, forgive us. All too often we have been content to just skim the surface. Lord, give us a picture of your vastness. For those who don't know you, show yourself to them that they might have a picture of your love and that you, Lord, can be trusted above all others. To you be all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.